So hello, hello. This is Postgres FM episode number 66 or 67. I don't remember. My name is Nikolai and I'm alone today because uh, Michael couldn't make it. So I don't like to be alone, actually. And I don't like to record myself alone in advance. So that's why it's live. But feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I also have uh, my co-host will be today, ChatGPT. Hello, ChatGPT. Hello, Nikolai. It's great to be here co-hosting Postgres FM with you. To our listeners, I'm eager to engage with your questions and thoughts in the chat. So, Nikolai, what's today's topic? Okay, uh, I hope uh, this. ChatGPT think will pronounce PostgreSQL correctly, I doubt. But uh, today we are going to talk about how to start and stop Postgres or stop and start Postgres faster and how to troubleshoot if, if it takes long. Uh, I recently started a new series of my sm small uh, how-to articles. I do it on Twitter initially, but then I spread to my LinkedIn and also there is markdown um, version on GitLab repositories but, um, where I already accumulated 10. Uh, so I, I, did, I, did, I started it 10 days ago. And uh, the idea is, uh, you know, like too much things in my head uh, that could be on paper with examples and, you know, like SQL queries or some snippets uh, for you can run in console like in bash snippets or something and uh, for example yesterday i talked about how to create flame graphs uh, if you have issues with some postgres running on your linux machine of course it wouldn't work on rds or uh, other managed services but you can if you have for example some issue on on uh, production you can reproduce it on a standalone postgres uh, on a linux machine and then uh, Perf or eBPF tooling uh, gives you very powerful capabilities uh, to see what's going on under the hood. So flame graphs is very is, is a very good tool to understand which functions in the source code take uh, too much time in CPU. But today we are going to discuss uh, stop and start uh, duration of Postgres. And this, of course, can be applied to any Postgres, any version of it, and including, of course, RDS or any other managed services. So let's start with, with um, uh, stop attempts. Uh, for example, you want to stop Postgres and see it takes long. Uh, what kind of reasons we can have? That sounds like a valuable series of how-to articles you've been creating, Nikolai. Understanding the nuances of Postgres and its operations is crucial for many developers and admins. Regarding your question on the duration of stopping Postgres, there are several reasons it might take longer than expected. One, active transactions. If there are active transactions when you attempt to stop the service, Postgres will wait for them to complete before shutting down. Two write ahead logs, Postgres could be flushing the wall to disk, which can sometimes delay the shutdown process. Three, background processes. Postgres runs several background processes like auto vacuum. These processes might delay the shutdown if they're in the middle of their operations. Four, connection draining. If there are active connections, Postgres will wait for them to disconnect or reach a safe state to shut down. For speeding up the process, one might consider issuing a fast shutdown command, which skips waiting for active transactions to complete. Okay, here I can interrupt uh, without hesitating. Uh, unlike when I, I'm with Michael, I'm always hesitating to interrupt Michael, but do it all the time, unfortunately. So I, I, I see, like, honestly, I didn't prepare this thing beforehand, so I didn't provide any ideas. So we see, obviously, a couple of first uh, reasons um, ChatGPT mentions uh, are really correct. I mean, they are they, they are the same as I list in my 
uh, how to article. I, I explain three reasons and how to deal with them. And first of the very first is indeed uh, ongoing long running transactions. So if we uh, usually if we try to stop uh, using most like default way, it's so called smart way. Uh, Postgres is going to wait until uh, ongoing work is done, and this is probably what is not what you want, uh, because uh, of course uh, maybe you need to stop faster, so you need to use so-called uh, fast uh, shutdown. It's it's uh, pgctl m fast. Uh, default is called smart, and in this case uh, it will uh, issue sig int instead of sig term uh, signal to the Postgres process. And uh, it means that uh, Postgres will interrupt all ongoing uh, transactions and proceed with uh, the startup, the, the shutdown process. Shutdown process is kind of quite complicated. Uh, if you can study uh, source code, I provide links in my article. I will provide them here uh, in the show notes as well. And uh, what like, this is simple. You just use fast shutdown. You you understand that ongoing transactions will be interrupted, but two other reasons are m much more interesting. And let's start uh, with uh, wall related and checkpoint related reason. I don't know. Is it working or not? Are you working? Certainly, Nikolai. Okay. The interaction between the write-ahead logs well and checkpoints plays a crucial role in PostgreSQL's shutdown process. When you initiate a shutdown, if there's a pending checkpoint, Postgres will attempt to complete that checkpoint before shutting down. Checkpoints are moments... No, 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 no. Uh, when we, we try to shut down Postgres, uh, first of all, uh, there is so thing so which is called a uh, shutdown checkpoint. So it's like... Always so. We try to shut down, and Postgres uh, wants to perform shutdown checkpoint. It means that all dirty buffers in the buffer pool needs to be flushed to disk. So, uh, so like this is clean clean shutdown. If you issue C kill uh, or like kill minus nine, which is like uh, kind of uh, crash crashing your Postgres uh, or just like. Uh, switching off power of whole machine. In this case, of course, it won't do it because it, like, it doesn't have a, uh, ability, uh, chances to, to do it. But in other cases, it tries to perform shutdown checkpoint. And uh, the trick with shutdown checkpoint is while it's doing it, it cannot accept new connections. And this is bad because if we accumulated a lot of dirty buffers in the buffer pool, it means, um, you know, like I don't like, I, I like Michael better. I don't like uh, it's, it's like not working very really well. Um, let's do it alone completely. So, uh, if you if you issue shutdown, uh, if you issue shutdown, shutdown checkpoint can be huge. Uh, of course, if your settings are default, it won't be huge because max wall size is one gigabyte. It means that only like roughly half a gigabyte of uh, dirty of uh, wall data uh, can be accumulated in the wall since the latest checkpoint and also if you have checkpoint timeout uh, default uh, like it's also small i think it's five minutes right uh, in this case uh, we we don't accumulate a lot of dirty buffers and it, it means that shutdown checkpoint will be fast but still it's not really pleasant because while uh, postgres is flushing dirty buffers on disk uh, it doesn't accept connections so the idea is we can run uh, checkpoint explicitly right before we shut down. It means that we like issue fast checkpoint using SQL command checkpoint. All dirty buffer. Dirty means changed buffers in the buffer pool, but not yet synchronized to disk. Uh, we issue checkpoint. Postgres flushes uh, all them on disk, and during this checkpoint, we still working still accepting connections so nobody actually notices it and then when we try to shut down immediately after our our checkpoint the shutdown checkpoint is going to be there still but it will be small because we just did we just performed uh, another checkpoint and uh, this is great 
sometimes we, you want to do two checkpoints actually i never did two checkpoints but uh, recently we discussed in my team and it turned out some like there is a, an opinion that two checkpoints is better because the first one can be really long and during that you again accumulated a lot of dirty buffers so probably two checkpoints and then shut down and um, uh, actually why uh, why we can accumulate a lot of and why we can want to accumulate a lot of dirty buffers because this is interesting and this will be related to our um, st startup timing troubleshooting so if you have default settings maxwell size is just one gigabyte current workloads are huge and one gigabyte it's not a lot actually right so you probably want to increase the distance in time uh, between your checkpoints because if you do checkpoints too frequently you have two kinds of overhead first kind of first kind of overhead we actually discussed it i think we had a special episode about it but just in case let me repeat uh the first kind of overhead is that you just flushed your your um dirty buffer it became clean and then immediately after it or like slightly later before next checkpoint so some backend again changed the content of this buffer and uh, you need to like it became dirty once again and if you have longer distance between two checkpoints a few writes might happen in the same buffer before you flush it so instead of flushing it multiple times you could flush it just once right in this case overhead becomes smaller and uh, of course if you have frequent checkpoints you have this chance to deal with the same buffer multiple times in checkpoints and uh, what kind of workloads are more um, experience this kind of uh, overhead more often of course random writes right so if you for example performing copy it will be quite kind of sequential load to to, to your system so it's not it's not going to experience such kind of problem a lot but if you for example trying to update some records using some index scan index scan can give you tuples in very random places in random buffers and in this case if it's massive random update not random i mean uh, not random uh, absolutely random but uh, just location of tuples is uh, not predictable and tuples are randomly sparsely stored for example and so on in this case uh, there are good chances that you will visit and revisit the same buffer during this massive update multiple times it can be not a single update it can be a, like some background migration happening and you have update in batches but still you revisit the same buffer multiple times and if the distance between checkpoints would be longer in this case you would probably uh, do multiple writes and just one uh, synchronization with disk uh, when, uh, when checkpoint is happening but it's not the uh, the only uh, problem the second problem is uh, full page writes by default full page writes are enabled because block size on disk is on file system uh, x4 is four kilobytes uh, our buffer size is eight kilobytes so to avoid the partial writes we need uh, to postgres needs to write the whole buffer to wall if it's the very first change of the buffer and uh, after latest checkpoint so if right right after our checkpoint we change something in the buffer for example just i don't know like single tuple we change single tuple so new version created uh, in this case postgres needs to write whole uh, buffer to wall and if wall compression is on it will compress it which is probably good in, in many cases maybe not always but sometimes it's all it's good uh hello chat by the way thank you for joining uh so e and subsequent changes of the same buffer pool before next checkpoint are going to be much lighter only the tuple itself will be written not whole buffer it means that if you have frequent checkpoints uh you need postgres needs to write more full page writes it increases the side of wall significantly right and this uh this is like this overhead is uh, is propagated to uh, replication and to archiving to backup system 
obviously. And also, of course, it takes more disk. Uh, compression helps at, to some extent, but of course, it's much better if you have infrequent checkpoints and just write less. But infrequent checkpoints uh, lead to the problem we are discussing here, right? So we can accumulate a lot of dirty pages and uh, shutdown attempt will be long unless you issue explicit checkpoint or two. And how we can actually see the number of dirty pages in the buffer pool just installing standard extension. Uh, it's contrib module shipped with Postgres itself. It's called PG buffer cache. And there is uh, in the, this buffer cache view, there is flag is dirty, I think is dirty, right? It's some Boolean flag. And you just you can just see how how many buffers are currently dirty. You can multiply them by eight kibibytes and uh, understand the volume of uh, of uh, data that needs to be synchronized with disk uh, uh, during next checkpoint or shutdown checkpoint. So the idea of speeding up is simple. You just want uh, you cannot avoid shutdown checkpoint unless you uh, crash your Postgres. Don't crash your Postgres. Uh, the idea is just to make its work uh, smaller, make its life simpler, just issuing one or two checkpoints right before shutdown. This helps a lot. And this is actually, this should be considered as a standard approach for fast restarts or fast shutdown attempts when we need to, for example, to perform uh, minor upgrade, for example, or some other works like other kinds of upgrade or switch over or something. If you want to stop current primary, uh, just do this. And final third reason of longer stop I discussed in my article is um, lagging archiving. Um, so lagging uh, archiving of walls. To, uh, it's related to backups. Archive command can be failing or just be, to be slow. And uh, we accumulated some walls which are not yet archived, pending walls. You can see, uh, for example, you can see failures in and last LSN. I think it's possible to see last LSN, right? In pgstat archive, archiver, this is uh, good to monitor. Anyway, you want to monitor uh, errors there and errors should be investigated because if you accumulated a lot of walls uh, which are not in the backups yet. It means that you might lose this data in case of disaster. You lost all the nodes. You need to recover from backups, but backups are lacking some, some walls, right? It's not good. I mean, this is a serious situation. Uh, you want to monitor the lag of archiving and uh, to ensure that all walls are archived in time. But um, here we deal with slightly different problem. And uh, I one day I discovered it on production. I discovered uh, that Patroni um, failed to perform failover because it was waiting. It was trying to stop Postgres and it was waiting, uh, waiting on archive command because a lot of walls were accumulated unnoticed. So one problem issue with backup system and wall archiving led to another problem. We cannot. Uh, stop Postgres and perform failover. Currently, Patroni already fixed. I think in version 2.1.2 it was fixed. Thank, thanks to Kukushkin for the very... Kukushkin is maintainer of Patroni. Kudos to Kukushkin to, for um, this very speedy reaction and uh, bug fix. Uh, and so right now, Patroni will perform failover and take care of our wall archiving separately. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, you just need to monitor and make sure that wall archiving is not lagging. You can introduce the concept of lag, of like how many walls are pending to be archived. And for example, say five is too much already, too, uh, too many. So we don't want it. We consider this as an incident and, and we have alerts, we investigate. Or you can measure the lag in bytes, uh, understanding that each wall is 16 uh, maybe by it, or, or it can be adjusted actually, and RDS adjusts it. It has uh, uh, 64 megabytes there. So that's it for um, stop attempt, stop, stopping attempt. Let's talk about startup. Uh, by the way, interesting point that sometimes 
like from my experience, people who don't understand what's happening, they say, oh, something wrong is happening and they start to be nervous. And instead of diving into details to understand what's happening with their ongoing attempt to stop or start, they just try to redo it or to be more aggressive, for example, kill minus, minus, minus none, seek kill, which is not good at all. Don't do that. Just try to understand what's happening and where we are currently in the process. So uh, I think that's it with uh, stop uh, action. What about start action? If uh, Postgres was stopped cle clear, um, without issues and sh shutdown checkpoint finished, everything should be fine. And if it's primary, it should start quite fast. But if it cr if it crashed and needs to recover all walls since the latest checkpoint, this is the whole idea of checkpoints and wall. Uh, after crash, we need to replay walls after the latest check uh, successful checkpoint. Uh, and okay, again, if uh, of course, if uh, checkpoint tuning was applied and distance between checkpoints is bigger, then this uh, startup redo phase will take longer. Or if you restore from backups, and this is very, very, very common situation, people restore from backups and don't understand why it's not starting, why it's not accepting connections, uh, and uh, like a lot of emotions, uh, new attempts, and so on. Uh, they see fatal, the database system is not yet accepting connections. I think everyone who works with Postgres long enough saw this error. Uh, interesting that it's fatal, but, it, but it's not fatal. Like it's it's normal. They just need, you, we just need to wait. Uh, and the problem here is that it's not easy to understand how long to wait. I think uh, for if you like, if you're interested in hacking Postgres, I think it's a good idea to improve this area and uh, try to deliver some good knowledge to users uh, uh, how long to wait. For example, uh, we can see in logs that redo process has started, but we have no idea uh, at from which position it was it started and how uh, which position will be considered as uh, consistent and ready ready for for work. Uh, sorry. So uh, if we if we ended up in this situation and we see such kind of error and understand that Postgres is performing redo, uh, we can find like few things, especially if if it's uh, if it's self-managed Postgres and everything is un under our control. First of all, you can um, inspect the process list and see. Uh, the the process Postgres process which is uh, performing redo. The, this will like p just with ps command you can grab uh, startup recovering and see it will give you uh, LSN basically LSN it's log sequence number it's position inside wall sequential position and uh, this is great so you understand like you can see you can check it multiple times and see it's progressing it's already uh, huge relief for most people to understand uh, that uh, we are waiting for something which is happening because the worst thing that uh, like nothing is happening and we wait we are waiting for 10 minutes it's not progressing like like what to do but usually we see it's progressing meaning that uh, redo is, is happening uh, we are moving forward and next question how long to else to wait in this case you need pg control uh, uh, data PG control data is standard uh, program shipped with Postgres, and you need to specify uh, dash capital D uh, PG data data directory, and it will show you a lot of metadata about your uh, Postgres um, uh, cluster. Cluster and here we mean like cluster is too overloaded term, but here we mean uh, our data directory basically. It will tell you a lot of interesting stuff, but also it will tell you. Uh, the position at which uh, Postgres will consider it uh, as consistency point. Uh, so you, uh, you you can see like a redo location, uh, checkpoint location, and also minimum recovery ending location. Actually, to be uh, precise, uh, this minimum recovery ending location is only related to cases when we recover from backups. 
restore Postgres from backups. If it's a, um, if we deal with uh, post crash recovery, this unfortunately will be zero slash zero. So we don't have this information. We don't know uh, when Postgres will consider itself as uh, successful. But in this case, we can inspect PG wall directory and understand, like ch just check the latest, the highest uh, value. Uh, and can, we can understand LSN by, uh, from the file name. I have another how to explaining this, uh, but uh, so we have two ways uh, how, uh, of understanding here. And unfortunately, if if, if it's managed Postgres uh, uh, service like RDS, and they don't provide you capability to use PG control data, uh, if they provide you only SQL, and currently we cannot use SQL because Postgres is not accepting connections, right? So in this case, I don't know what to do. You know, ask your vendor of managed Postgres, uh, and maybe they need to improve and provide, for example, some interface, some API CLI interface to PG control data and process list. Because when Postgres is starting long, because we tune checkpoints, because we want, right? And it's starting long, we, we want to, to understand uh, where we are and how long to wait. Again, Postgres could report this in logs, and this is a good idea to think about implementing this. I think it's not super hard. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a hacker and I don't have a lot of time. I could probably do it, uh, but uh, I'm not a hacker. So, But I have this idea, and uh, if you um, have uh, interest in this, uh, I think it would be great to see in logs LSN position. I, mean, I know recently in Postgres 16, uh, Checkpoint now reports LSN positions, and like Checkpoint position is reported to logs. It's new feature of, of Postgres 16. So next, uh, like logical development of this in this area could be if we recover, redo uh, should report details about where we started, where we are. For example, each I don't know, like thirty seconds it could report, uh, and so we could see the progress right in the logs. And finally, where like how long to wait, where where we will stop. Obviously, like if you have these data points in terms of LSN and you observe the progress, you can predict, you can have some forecast. It's easy. You understand the speed. Yeah. As a reminder, you can take two LSNs and in working Postgres, you can just subtract, subtract one from another and uh, the difference will be in bytes. So it's good. And if we see the difference in bytes, we can understand the, the speed. If we have timestamps, right? of current position, uh, we understand like, for example, each each minute we replay, I don't know, like five gigabytes, for example, or two gigabytes, depends on, you, on your uh, hardware uh, resources. And um, you know, in this case, we understand the speed and assuming speed is basically, we are moving at the same speed all the time. Of course, it's not so, but we can assume it. Uh, in this case, and knowing the final point, we can, predict when we will uh, reach it and this is uh, the, I, I did it many times because I have systems with like huge maxwell size and checkpoint timeout for example 100 gigabytes maxwell size and checkpoint amount 30 or 60 minutes and of course start up uh, when recovering from backups or after crash there is takes quite long and without understanding, I, I was my, myself in that situation. And I saw so many times people become nervous, they restart the process, and this is not efficient way to, to deal with this problem at all. Okay, I hope this help. This is helpful. Now let's see if we have questions in chat. No, and another hi, hi again. I hope this was helpful. And uh, if you have questions, uh, just uh, leave them in comments. And again, thank you everyone. This like we do it already like 66 weeks in a row. Sometimes so I'm alone or Michael is alone, but uh, we continue. And now I have daily a commitment to have this Postgres marathon, Postgres how tos. I, I I want to reach uh, 365 days in a row. It, it will be challenging, but uh, so far today is day 11. Uh, so far, it's working. I hope it will, will work. So check out my tw uh, my Twitter, LinkedIn, or the GitHub, GitLab repository where these articles are stored. Okay, thank you so much. Until next one. Bye.